Hey everyone, it's Brittany, the Executive Director at the Stacks Foundation. I'm joined by Dave from Flipside Crypto. Um, and I just want to say we love what Flipside Crypto has been able to do. They've been able to give well-rounded research and data to our community about what's happening on the Stacks blockchain. Their data products provide more transparency, which everyone has always asked for, and easy to use information, not only about the projects um, like Stacks, but also for the whole community to see where the tokens are going. So today we have some exciting news to share with you. Um, I'd like to hand it over to Dave to tell you more. Excellent, thanks, Brittany. Um, look, we're we're huge fans of Stacks. We've been we've been uh, you know er, early on have been have been watching what you've been building and um, have been super excited about every everything you've been doing. Right now, with what you're about to launch today, is is just um, incredible. Um, at Flipside, um, for those who don't know, we we have uh, solutions that allow us to decode blockchain behaviors and understand uh, what certain stakeholders are doing within those ecosystems. And um, we work at about 50 different blockchains, um, uh, and we produce uh, Stax's data inside of our data co-op. That's uh, co-op.flipsidecrypto.com, where you can actually see. Uh, the movement of uh, behaviors within the ecosystem and what they're doing um, and their active supply. So um, helping drive that transparency for some of the launch that's uh, that's coming up today. Great. So for the community, what else does that mean, right? So now there's a lot of data. Uh, we've had a lot of people ask about um, Stacks rewards. We did a poll and that was something people wanted to see more about. So could you go in a little specifically about like what the co-op can do? Sure. So, um, so yeah, stacking rewards, like the community seems to be interested as many communities are, you know, what's happening with stacking rewards? Uh, what, what type of dApps and DeFi activity are occurring? Mining rewards, supply distribution, things like that. Um, so what the co-op is, is able to see is in real time, 30 day active supply where assets are moving. So are stacking rewards building up? Are they moving uh, between different types of stakeholders? Uh, and you can really keep keep an eye on exactly the sort of health and the behavior of the overall ecosystem in real time inside of that product. Yeah, and what I love about the product is that it's very easy to see. The visuals are very clear. You're not digging just through a ton of numbers. Um, they have some great ways that you can kind of see uh, what's going on. So where can people find out more about uh, Stacks on the flip side uh, co-op? Yep, co-op to flipsidecrypto.com and... Uh, and then I believe the forward slash is stacks, but you'll see the URL there. And when you get there, you'll see on the left what Brittany's talking about is the bubbles. The bubble we call we tried to kill the name bubbles, but everyone loves it. The bubbles chart. It's a little bit hypnotic, so be careful when you watch it because you're going to see all the movement happening in real time. Um, you can also, by the way, um, while you're there, see benchmarks. Uh, so understand um, you know stacks behavior next to other chains. Uh, and all sorts of other information that might help you get a real feel for, for the health. Um, yeah, it's fun Great. times. <laughs> well, thanks, Dave. Thanks for joining us. And uh, thanks for supporting all the data about Stacks Blockchain on Flipside. Thank you, Brittany. Go Stacks. <laughs>
maybe the Bitcoin blockchain. So sit back next to your glowing YouTube fireplace and enjoy. Um, please welcome back Brittany to introduce the first of our fireside chat speakers. Great, thank you, Peter. <laughs> that was a very interesting tidbit. Um, well, I know you guys won't be disappointed. I have two great guests coming on for our first fireside chat. Uh, Maneeb Ali, CEO of Hero and founder of Blockstack, as well as Peter from blockchain.com, which is the world's most popular way to buy, hold, and use crypto with over 64 million wallets, as well as $620 billion in transactions. So I'm excited to introduce the chat, and I think you should stay tuned because there's a special announcement in this chat you won't want to miss. So here's Peter and Manip. Thank you, Brittany. Welcome. Awesome. Thank hey, you, Brittany. Brittany. How's it going? Hey, it's great. Um, you know, I think uh, there's people that really love the new mandatory work from home era and people that don't. And uh, I'm definitely in the love it uh, category. Um, I feel like I'm missing a little bit. Really? Yeah. Oh man, you uh, you, you can't uh, you can't bring me back. I'll, uh, oh, seriously? I'm in the office now. Right. I I guess I go, don't miss the commute, but I, I I miss the team and like being around them and like you know just chatting versus video calls all the time. But uh, let me let me start off by looking back into the early days of crypto. Right. Like I feel like. This is 2021 now. I, it's hard to imagine how many years. So I, I entered 2013, but I think you're way more OG than, than that as well. Would love to kind of like for our audience, go back to the very beginning. Like when did you start? How did you start? How did you discover all of this? Yeah, so I'm a, I'm class of late 2010, um, but really not actually because I thought it was kind of a joke in 2010. Uh, so I don't deserve, you know, don't get any credit there. Um, I really started playing around in a serious way in 2012. Uh, so early 2012. Um, and, you know, the crypto world was very different back then. As you know, um, there was a lot of very small meetups. I remember the first conference I went to was in a hotel conference room. It was that small. And I think 80% of the conference was wearing Guy Fox masks. Or you know other kinds of uh, you know people thought I was wild because I wasn't wearing a mask, uh, and and so it was a different crowd back then. Um, and that crowd is still with us, but you know maybe a smaller portion. Uh, and it was a different vision in crypto uh, as well. You know, Bitcoin was very much going to be a one-chain sort of ecosystem, payments for the internet, you know, cash money for the internet, uh, and that vision has changed over time for Bitcoin. What, what is this in Bitcoin price terms? Like, you know, for, for reference, roughly what range was Bitcoin in? Oh, well under $100. I think you could still buy Bitcoins for like eight, 12 bucks or something like that. Okay. Um, I, 2013 yeah. was 90 bucks when, when, when I got introduced. Yeah, you know, I, I remember Bitcoin going into the sort of $20 range okay. and thinking it was really odd. Uh, and Actually, so I actually feel like the move from 10 to 100 was much stranger to me than the move from 1,000 to 10,000 or 10,000 to 40,000. Um, like as time's gone on, Bitcoin has felt more and more inevitable, even though it's bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, versus the early days when it felt very unlikely and precarious. Um, and you know, one of the things that I think is cool going on in the industry today is folks like yourselves who are looking to extend, you know, these ecosystems through, you know, parachains or whatever your preferred term is. But you know, back then it was really the plan was everything was going to be right there on Bitcoin. And I remember even you were, you know, originally exploring a lot of ideas when we met so many years ago. Um, that were really attached to the Bitcoin blockchain and then, you know, another chain and so on and so forth. But the evolution of the protocols in the industry is, is really been the biggest change um, over the last probably three or four years. Yeah. And I feel like 
I would love to learn more about your initial thinking for blockchain.com because one thing that always stood out was you you had a very clear vision for how you're not going to take um, custody of any private keys. This is a software. Let people kind of like, you know, uh, build it that way. And and that, that was a camp that, you know, you, you've been in for a, for, for a very long time. Yeah, so we've had, you know, a few product innovations or product insights at blockchain that have kind of led to the success that we've had to date. The first was that people would like to see data about cryptocurrency on a website, which seems like a very basic idea, but in 2011 was not. Um, and so organizing all the information about the Bitcoin blockchain and markets into one easy to use site was big innovation. Today, that product still generates, you know, 100 million plus page views, you know, and sometimes in a day. So it's, it's wild. Um, you know, it supports many, many blockchains now. The second insight we had that was really important was that people wanted the convenience of a cloud wallet, so a PayPal style wallet, with the security of having their own private key. Right. And that was a very controversial idea at the time. Um, people thought no one, no normal people would ever use it. Turned out that the biggest boon for us was every time someone would get hacked. So people always think that that's Mt. Gox. Actually, the first one was BitcoinWallet.com, which no one listening to this remembers, but was sort of the original Coinbase, actually. Not that Coinbase is going to run away with your money, but it, you know they would sell you Bitcoins in a brokerage experience and then hold them for you. And uh, that guy exit scammed. It was like the first really big exit scam. And it was our first big growth inflection moment on the hybrid wallet, uh, which is really amazing and, and really great for the company. And then, you know, every single time there's been a hack or security incident, it's always affected us very positively. But that insight allowed us to scale globally and, and really allowed us to build a really significant user base in crypto. You know, today we're probably responsible on any given day for about 33 to 36% of all Bitcoin transactions. You know, the next nearest entity is probably at 12, 13%. So between that and how many Bitcoins that we're storing for customers or helping customers store, we're definitely the biggest Bitcoin company on earth um, by any sort of like reasonable metric uh, of actual Bitcoin usage, which is always yeah, a little triggering for some yeah, people. That, yeah. That's amazing. I feel like uh, blockchain now it's hosted on blockchain.com, but blockchain.info back in the day, that would be the standard way for anyone to do their first transaction, right? Like if the transaction yeah. is not, not on blockchain.info, you're like, it hasn't happened. You're like that's, that was kind of like yeah. the, the default thing. And that's still the case for a lot of people. Um, you know, and, and we did run the most popular .info website in the world for several years, which is sort of a panic victory. Uh, and then we switched to the .com. Uh, for a lot of reasons which are not that interesting today you know we actually support a full range of crypto experiences so you you know you what's important to us is not that you never store your crypto with us but that you always have the choice not to and that we make it really really easy this is kind of similar to google which says like we want to make it really easy for you to leave our products facebook makes it possible google makes it really easy and they say, well because we want to be a challenge for us to keep you. That's why like, you know, you can set up superhuman on top of your Google account in like two seconds, right? Because they want that pressure from other competitive products. So for us, we always wanna make it easy for you to move your crypto out of us or for you to store your keys yourself. But we do store a very significant amount of crypto for consumers now for an, in our custodial trading products, which has been both, of our, both our wallet as well as our exchange. And then we store our billions worth of crypto for institutions as well. Uh, and so in total, you know, we're storing probably also one of the largest custodians in the market now of, of you know, sort of cold storage of crypto assets. Yep, that, I, I wanna get into some of the lending and liquidity side in a little bit uh, and really agree with your model of like the underlying network is open and anyone can use it. But even on the user interface side, you're kind of like saying, like you have the freedom to exit if you want to, like you have optionality, you wanna use this version, you can, if you don't want to, here, here are alternatives available. But let me let me move forward a little bit in the in the timeline. Let's let's go through the 2017 era, right? Like how is that for you? How did you see the industry change and, and kind of like what happened? What were what are the main things that have changed from 2017 to say now? 
Oh man, what a big question. What has changed from 2017 to now? Well, you know, look, we're all still struggling to keep our websites up, right? So that hasn't changed. Um, uh, you know, look, <clears throat> it's kind of funny. Uh, I was talking to someone actually from uh, Google's, uh, you know, their internal like team that keeps the, their internal data center traffic up. And uh, he was like, well, how are you guys doing? Google's one of our major investors. And uh, they're like, how are you guys doing? I was like, well, you know, we've gone down the least. And he was like, <laughs> looking at your track record, <laughs> he's like, you've had some serious system degrade degradation. It's like, well, we haven't gone down. And he's like, who are these other people going down? And you're like, oh. Um, but you know, in crypto, keeping your website up sometimes is a mission in and of itself. So that hasn't changed. I think the big change though, you know, to be honest, is is the size and scale of a lot of our clients. You know, today, like, you know, 2017, if we got a client coming in for a hundred mil order, it would have been like, you know, we better call, we should call the board. This is so exciting. Uh, and now, you know, I might get called. Like the team might call me about a hundred million dollar order, but they might not. You know, and so the size of the institutions involved in the space has really escalated over the last three years. And I think that's a really positive thing to see. And, and, and what about some of the new layer one blockchains that are coming up? I know you, you guys have done deep integrations with a bunch of them. Yeah, so look, Ethereum is the number one chain in crypto by any reasonable metric. Um, the number one protocol in a crypto for sure by any reasonable metric. And they're really the one to beat. I think it's gonna be really, really hard to unseat Ethereum um, for all the reasons that people say, but also the simple reality that critical mass ensures that Ethereum gets a lot of attention and love from people like me who are leading product at big companies, right? So, you know, like myself, you know, even for example, um, you know, the coin, it's like we'll spend most of our time thinking about Ethereum not that we don't love Bitcoin. Everyone loves Bitcoin. It's just, there's not a lot of new things that you need to worry about there. It's very stable. So I think it's gonna be hard to unseat Ethereum. Now, once you kind of go past Ethereum and you assume like there's something catastrophic underneath, I think there's probably like a top tier list of five contenders and I'm not smart enough on the space to distinguish between the top contenders. And then there's like 30 more that have like a very outside chance. And I'm very much not smart enough to distinguish between those. Um, I think some of the projects that I follow really closely, and this is not investment advice, is um, like some of them I don't own a position in at all, so I do. One is uh, for sure Algorand, uh, which I know you guys, you know those guys as well, but Steve and, and Myra and all those, they're doing amazing technical work. Uh, Near, I'm really interested in what the guys in Near are doing. I'm really interested in what um, the folks at Dot are doing. And I was incredibly excited about Ton, which is you know now being canceled. Um, but Ton was really exciting as a project from a technical level. And then, you know, uh, I'm clearly spending some time excited about the Stacks ecosystem. You know, and, and I'm here today speaking with you guys about that. Yeah, speaking speaking of Stacks, like, you know, what's the, what's the special announcement I'm, I'm hearing about? <laughs> the, um, the announcement is we're going to add uh, STX to the exchange shortly, um, and we'll also be providing a lot of credit and, and market services for our institutional desk to the you know to the Stacks ecosystem, um, which we're excited about doing. I think for me the coolest part of Black Stack and Stacks as an ecosystem is actually the compatibility into Bitcoin, and the focus on coexisting with Bitcoin rather than replacing Bitcoin which I think is a really smart strategy, honestly, in terms of looking for that edge to how you're going to win that layer two vertical. I think the, even if the, even if a lot of the Bitcoin community will perhaps not love it, I think give having that like sort of Bitcoin friendly mindset is really going to do you a lot of good in the consumer space. Like what I would call like people who love crypto, but aren't addicted to Twitter. Um, I think that you're going to get a lot of value from there. Uh, that's in a really good way. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm noticing the same thing. Like, you know, obviously it's a spectrum of Bitcoin community. The people who are really hard liners, they would, they would find one thing or the other that they don't like about the project. But a lot of the Bitcoin community is actually pretty excited about it. And even, even to my surprise, 
that they, they get the part that, yes, we are using Bitcoin as a settlement layer. They want Bitcoin to be used as a settlement layer. They like the fact that we don't modify Bitcoin at all. So we're not saying, Bitcoin, you mm -hmm. need to change this, you need to change that. Bitcoin remains exactly like how it is. And our technology basically just, just simply works out, out of the box with it. But super, super excited to hear about uh, the blockchain.com exchange integration and, and uh, some on the liquidity side. I feel like you've been watching this project for such a long time. The 2.0 was literally years and years of work. Like we we invented a new programming language, we invented new consensus mechanisms and have been building the public infrastructure. And uh, and I think today is the day when, when Stacks 2.0 is going live. I'm so glad that uh, I was able to host you and, and share this chat with uh, our community and audience. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. And, you know, it's been fun watching you guys build it. You guys definitely built it as like, you know, R and D, and you know, almost like PhD process, like very intentional, very methodical. Um, you know, whereas, and I think that's probably reflective of you as a founder. Uh, whereas blockchain is very much like a product hacker sort of situation, and so I think you know a lot of our conversations over the years have been really fun, which is basically this, you know, for some some sauce in the kitchen talk, which is basically me being like, ship, ship, ship. And you being like, but let's ship right, um, <laughs> which has been a bit of fun part of our a fun part of uh, of you and I's friendship, and it's really great to see the 2.0 launch now. For sure. Let me let me switch topics a little bit. Uh, I know you mentioned the um, Telegram blockchain and how the project got shut down, and I know that you know you guys you guys are actually based out of the U.S. Most, mostly uh, mostly in England, although you have so many subsidiaries, like it's hard to track <laughs> keep track of like which jurisdictions you actually hit. Um, but what's your what's your view on the U.S. regulations with you know things happening with Ripple? The kind of approach that we took, which was people thought it was very contrarian, like back then, but uh, now it's it's it seems like you know all that all that overhead that we were uh, kind of like working with uh, might might have actually paid off. I don't think any of us will understand that until the year twenty twenty five, maybe twenty thirty. Like it's going to take a really long time for all this to play out. Um, really long time. And it kind of goes up and down, right? Like, and I've been involved in crypto a very long time. And so I've been here when everyone's saying that like doing the really well regulated thing is a great idea. I've been here when everyone's like, wow, like, you know, if only Muneeb had like done an offshore offering, you know, he'd now have the market cap of X crypto. Sure, you know, sure. I, you know, and I've been through it myself where people are like, man, why are you getting regulated by the FCA when you could just jump jurisdictions every eight weeks and like, never travel to America again. And it's like, so it comes and goes. And I think that we won't really know what, and I think we won't really know what the best strategy is until 2025, 2030, when this all shakes out. So yeah, it's a, I definitely think like the sentiment is changing. There's definitely the fluctuation, right? Like two years ago, every everyone in the industry has made their mind that a, hey, Here's a here's a standard way of doing something, and then two years later, like they would have would have completely uh, shifted their mind. But but let's see, like I think our with our legal framework, the U.S. trading markets are finally opening up. So I do see the point uh, that some people bring up that it obviously took us much longer to open up these trading markets versus some of the other approaches that people were following in the uh, in the early days. So so have you have you been following the the decentralized finance? Type of uh, activity in the crypto space lately, especially on the on the liquidity side. Because I know you you, you play there. You know we're we're actually you know I've just been hiding in a little cave, ignoring all the DeFi stuff for the last two years. Now uh, we're pretty we're pretty active there, uh, both from our venture fund as well as you know looking at the market pretty actively. Um, I think a lot of it is uh, anytime like. A new thing develops in crypto. The first couple of years are pretty, pretty shady. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of uh, fast money versus slow money, and I'm kind of a slow money guy. I like to do things that are going to last a long time, and you know, the ideal thing for me is to never have to sell an investment. DeFi that doesn't work very well, so we're not trying to be in huge size in DeFi right now until we feel like we're 
until we feel like DeFi is ready for slow money. Do you guys are are you guys looking into like being a liquidity provider on any of the decentralized exchanges or? You know, we're not mostly because the volume is not that big. Once you strip out the like sort of wash. Second thing is the moment we're really busy, really, really, really busy. Um, and so that's tough uh, in terms of going into the DeFi space and, and just generally wanting to be sort of where the slow money is versus where the fast money is. Got it. So it looks like we have a question from the audience. Uh, the question is that for the blockchain.com exchange listing, would that be available to US people or it will be for non-US non, non -US people? I think we'll want to be expanding it to as many customers as we possibly can. The US is always a state-by-state -state decision um, and uh, slow. Everything in the US happens slowly. Uh, so it depends on the date. Uh, you know, I think over time, eventually, it'll, you'll see it in the US. I see. And initially, it will be more focused on the European markets, or like broadly in the in the world. But some jurisdictions might 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 not be eligible. That's right. Yeah, we have a very um, sort of very jurisdiction by jurisdiction approach to launching new assets. Uh, that part of running an exchange is extremely complicated. So the. So the next question, Peter, for you is that what are some of your uh, slow money products? Well, so, you know, the biggest thing that I work on is this little company called blockchain.com. I think that's a, a great slow money investment. Uh, we've been doing it a long time and we'll be here in 30, 40 years. Um, I think Bitcoin is slow money. I think um, Ethereum is definitely slow money. Um, I think the guys working on remittances and stable coins are definitely in the slow money phase of, of market evolution now. I think a lot of the shit coins and DeFi stuff is fast money. And what I mean by slow and fast money is like fast money is like fast money in, fast money out. So like you're just, you know, high velocity. Slow money is like, like I'm not sure that I'll ever sell my Ethereum like to buy other things. Like I, I might just always have them and use them in the internet economy. I may never sell my Ethereum. Um, whereas like, if I buy the latest shitcoin, I'm probably gonna sell that thing, right? So that's the difference between slow and fast money. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. By the way, uh, the blockchain.com distribution that you did last year for Stacks, you have no idea how many people every single day in our Telegram ask us about that. Like, I think half of our traffic is basically users from blockchain.com asking the same question that when is that unlocking? So maybe maybe you can address that. That uh, I believe it, it's unlocking later in, in January. You, you probably wouldn't know from the top of your head. But the next question always is that, are you going to enable people to earn Bitcoin uh, for, for the distribution that they got? So this is a, a tough answer here, but um, the first thing is we never really announce when we're going to exactly add assets uh, because we're concerned about market impact and we take that really seriously and carefully. It is in our roadmap and it is in our near-term roadmap. Um, I don't know if it'll initially launch with staking or without. That kind of level of detail is a little... I'm not involved in the planning of that usually. I'm just in the review of what the product team wants to do. So I don't know the answer to that question, but I do know it's in the roadmap and I do know we're excited about supporting it in the wallet. Awesome. Well, Peter, I'll, I'll throw one last question at you. And that is that outside of work, like what are the things that are kind of like keeping you busy or what are you interested in? I know that you have jammed over sleep optimizations and you know other geeky things like that, but what's, what's keeping you busy outside of work? Yeah, I'm still on my sleep optimization kick because I, I haven't made a lot of progress. I'm a really, I'm a really bad sleeper. So if, if anyone has uh, sleep ideas, um, you can find me on Twitter, one more Peter. Um, I think, you know, and, and for what it's worth, I go to bed when I'm tired. I just wake up at like six in the morning, super stoked and like ready to, ready to go. Um, I'm spending a lot of time actually learning about Buddhism right now. 
Okay. Uh, it was like a new random hobby. It was, uh, me, I was inspired by one of the guys on our team um, to learn about Buddhism. And so spending a lot of time there. Uh, and then, um, you know, in somewhat related fashion, I, in this whole work from home era, have started doing a lot of like mini yoga sessions throughout the day. You know, so we're just, we're just hanging out here and doing, trying to figure out sleep, studying Buddhism and doing many yoga sessions in between a lot of, uh, a lot of crypto flow action. Well, that would, that would definitely keep you calm and collected while, you know, the crypto markets are going crazy. Let me, let me share one, sure. one Peter story, right? So I was, uh, I, I was struggling with sleep as well. And I was, I was asking him about, you know, how do you regulate sleep, especially with travel? And Peter's answer was, that he actually has the exact same sleeping setup in three different cities in the world. I, I won't name them. I, I don't want to disclose your locations. But so it's effectively think of it like whatever you know optimizations you have, like cooling beds, uh, noise machines, like you know dark curtains, or uh, I think one hack you told me was about uh, not eating too much when getting on a plane. And because that kind of like really helps your body self-regulate, that one that one actually worked pretty well for me. Uh, but so so I'll give you the updates on that real quick. First of all, because of COVID, I've actually been trying out new cities, and a um, few things you can learn from that. One is if you own an iPad, a newer iPad, they are actually way better at playing sleep audio than sleep audio machines. So I now play the sleep audio from an iPad, not from an audio machine. Second is like a really good eye mask solves. 70% of your problems everywhere. Turns out you didn't need to put in blackout curtains and, and all the expensive stuff. The Mindfold eye mask from Amazon will take care of everything for you. And then the third thing is, it's really more than anything else about how cold the room is. And so you just really need to crank the temperature in the room down. And then yeah, last but not least, never eat the food on planes. It's terrible for you, it has way too much salt and preservatives. And if you arrive somewhere hungry and then eat the next meal at the right time of day, it helps reset your whole digestive system to that time zone. So, so that would that would be like a poor man's version of the same optimizations, and maybe 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 you can get better better results. Well, well, actually, I don't have any houses anymore. <laughs> I uh, I'm I'm living a homeless lifestyle this year. Uh, I wanted to have a life of less things, um, and so uh, I'm now optimizing with you know just an eye mask and a and a good air conditioner. Cool, awesome. Well, Peter, I know I, I know I can chat with you all day. We are hopefully after the virus is under control, we can we can hang out and continue our conversations. But until then, this was the uh, the best thing we could have done. Thanks so much. Really excited about the updates from blockchain.com, and uh, and thank thanks again for coming here. Ciao. Take care.
Hi, it's Rachel with Cointelegraph and today I'm here with Muneeb. He is the co-founder of Stacks and the CEO of Hero PVC. And today we're going to be discussing the official launch of the mainnet. Hi, Muneeb, how are you? I'm good, uh, excited to be here. So it looks like the, the Genesis block of the Stacks 2.0 blockchain just launched and then miners are officially mining here. It's a really big moment for our community. Uh, like imagine that this design of building around Bitcoin, people weren't even fully sure that is this even possible or not. There's a very famous quote from uh, Satoshi himself on Bitcoin Talk, where he talks about uh, this vision of separate blockchains and use cases, but they share the compute power of Bitcoin, right? And that, that was kind of like the original idea that Bitcoin can be this uh, base layer, this really secure base layer, and all sorts of other use cases and applications are possible. But instead of kind of like disconnected separate blockchains, they all are benefiting from the security of Bitcoin. So the consensus mechanism that we launch is the first consensus mechanism between two blockchains, but not between two any blockchains, between Bitcoin and between Stacks, right? So our mm -hmm. all the data on the Stacks blockchain, all the transactions on the Stacks blockchain, they get secured by Bitcoin and mining actually happens on the Bitcoin chain itself. So that's the process that actually started and in many ways, like I've been in the industry since 2013. And in many ways, it feels like we are coming back full circle to that original design uh, of, of build, building around Bitcoin. Wow. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, how does this relate to secure smart contracts and BTC and apps on BTC? Yes. So there are two things there. One is that uh, when we saw the potential of smart contracts, obviously they are a very, very powerful tool. Uh, smart contracts weren't possible before uh, blockchains, but at the same time, there are a lot of potential security problems as well, right? Because it's code that you just publish once and then it kind of like runs by itself and, and can have bugs or errors and people can lose hundreds of millions of dollars as, as we have seen in, in, over, over the course of several years. So we've been uh, developing a new programming language. It's called Clarity. And the main benefit of the programming language is the developers can have formal proofs of uh, execution. Like basically, that is this program correct? Is it going to do what you want it to do before executing the program? And that's almost like night and day difference if you can do that before executing a program versus just waiting for a smart contract to execute and then you know, hope that every, everything kind of like goes well. So Clarity was designed by scientists from, from Princeton and MIT. It's been around in, in the process of development for two plus years now. And now finally Clarity language also went live with the, with the, with the launch of the mainnet. And the special thing about running Clarity uh, in the Stacks blockchain is that these smart contracts, they have full visibility into Bitcoin. Meaning that for the first time, developers can actually start writing programs, computer programs, these smart contracts, uh, where they can look at the logic or state of Bitcoin and actually uh, actually write code against that. And that's that, that that's super exciting as well. Oh, wow. Yeah, that is. That's really exciting. So with that in mind, how will this official mainnet, mainnet launch affect the blockchain community as a whole? Yeah, so I do think that uh, one impact that we, we definitely hope that it has is that it encourages more innovation around Bitcoin. I, I think that Bitcoin is definitely uh, kind of like the first thing that people discover, even, even developers or, or general community members. And it is that, that secure base, uh, kind of like the anchor of the entire crypto industry. But people currently soon discover that, hey, I can't really program Bitcoin. I can't really write smart contracts or applications against it. And then they start looking for other solutions and discover other things. And, and our hope is that with this launch, like that changes a little bit and it attracts more developers to Bitcoin. It basically opens the doors for smart contracts directly around Bitcoin or building all sorts of applications. For example, Bitcoin by far has the largest amount of crypto capital and, and this capital can be deployed in smart contracts. People are coming up with all sorts of uh, innovative new, uh, new products, new exchanges, new types of uh, lending platforms and so on. And we are, we, are, are, we are hoping that with this launch, some of that uh, excitement and development activity can directly come to the Bitcoin system. Yeah, definitely. Well, that's exciting. It sounds like it will have a huge impact. And I can't wait to hear more. So congratulations and thank you again for taking the time to speak with me. Thanks. Thank, thanks for having me here.